Hello everyone, my name is Emanuele Bardone and I'm the uh, director of the master's program in educational technology which uh, in the last uh, few months uh, has become really a hot topic for reasons that you may actually guess. In this video I will try to address a few issues that I have encountered uh, in my own uh, practice. What I basically do when it comes to um, online courses more specifically how to design online courses. I have started teaching in this format uh, back in 2017 and the reason was uh, that our master's program is a blended master's program which means that uh, uh, we meet uh, the students at the beginning of, of the academic year for about two weeks uh, after which uh, uh, the entire master's program runs online. What I'm going to do is basically describe uh, uh, the result of three years of uh, uh, experimentation with uh, uh, educational technologies. I'm going to start from uh, um, a very simple consideration uh, which I think that you uh, may have come across uh, the moment in which uh, you have switched from uh, a traditional format to an online format. In your case I suspect for most of you this was dictated by the circumstances, by the lockdown. In uh, traditional courses, uh, uh, which is also what I've experienced uh, as, a, as a student, uh, the central element, uh, uh, the pillar uh, of traditional courses uh, is the lecture. Now what I mean by lecture is something that is not easy to define. Uh, because a lecture can be conducted uh, uh, and interpreted in very different ways. Uh, there can be uh, the traditional lecture, what we usually call the traditional lecture, which is uh, basically uh, the professor uh, speaking for about uh, 80, 90 minutes. But there is also the in more interactional lecture in which uh, there is some kind of back and forth between the professor, the lecturer and the, and, the, and the students. But in any case, no matter how we interpret what a lecture is and how we conduct it, uh, the lecture remains the main uh, uh, pillar of uh, traditional courses. For example, it's the moment in which we meet with the students and it's also the moment in which the occasion in which we share our knowledge and uh, our understanding. Now what happened with the lockdown was that uh, we were not able to do this and therefore something important, something structural concerning um, uh, the way in which we uh, organize teaching and learning has happened. I want to stress this element because I think that the biggest deal is precisely this that the traditional way of organizing teaching and learning activities uh, all of a sudden collapsed. Now, the lockdown uh, literally forced us to rethink, to reimagine, and most of all to reorganize and redesign our teaching and learning activities. And I actually believe that when it comes to online education, this is essentially the biggest challenge, which is how, how can we think, imagine, and then reorganize our learning and teaching activities uh, in the light of the tools that we have. And I must say that in 2020, the amount of tools that we can rely upon is huge. Now, the bottom line is that uh, the variety of tools that we have, which is sometimes quite overwhelming, allows us or gives us the chance uh, to, as I said, rethink, reimagine and reorganize the core business of teaching and learning. So the very first question that I asked myself back then when I started online education, eh, which is still very much relevant nowadays after three years, is precisely this. How can I reorganize my teaching activities in the light of the tools that I have? What I try to describe eh, uh, in what is going to come next uh, is my own way of uh, trying to reorganize some core activities related to teaching and learning given the tools that I've come to appropriate. The first question that I addressed, uh, which is also what I suggest you to think of, is uh, what kind of pedagogical framework uh, would suit uh, 
the kind of uh, subject or the kind of subjects that I have to teach students. For example, one of my courses uh, is called Critical Issues of Technology Use in Education. The main goal of this course is to uh, engage the students in a series of discussions which would uh, help them reflect on technology use in their own educational practices. All our students are in one way or the other education practitioners. Most of them are teachers. So the goal in this course is to try to make them reflect how they use technology and to raise issues that the critical issue that they might encounter in their own practice. Because this is the overall goal of the uh, course, I adopt what uh, in jargon uh, is called uh, uh, project-based learning. To cut the story short, uh, the main and, and only assignment is a project that students are supposed to carry out in the second part of the course. The only thing that I tell them is that uh, at the end of the course uh, they are supposed to present the results of their project. The project work is usually conducted in the second part of the course, but what is it that I do in the first part of the course? Usually the first part of the course, which is actually what I'm going to focus on now, is uh, concentrated on the discussion on a number of critical issues uh, uh, of technology use in education. For example, we discuss uh, what is innovation, what is the difference between technological innovation and educational innovation. We discuss about uh, what is meaningful use of technology use. And we also try to uncover the possible drawbacks uh, of uh, technology use in education. What I would normally do in a traditional course would be to have a series of lectures in which I uh, just introduce uh, some of these critical issues concerning technology use in education. But since this is an online course, I had to reorganize the way in which I engage the students. My courses usually start at the end of September and they end at the end of January. So roughly we're talking about a period that is uh, covering more or less four months. So we're talking about uh, 16 weeks. So what I simply do is to divide these 16 weeks into two parts. As I said, the second part is dedicated to the project work, whereas in the first eight weeks, I try to engage, as I said, students in meaningful conversations, which have the main goal to introduce some of the critical issues that students might encounter in their own project. The first thing that I usually do is to divide these eight weeks into four blocks, each and every block lasting for about uh, two weeks. What is it that I'm doing in each and every block? Well, usually each and every block has a certain structure, which I'm going to describe now. The first thing that is very important for me is uh, to engage students, as I said before, in meaningful conversations. Having students' engagement is, for me, one of the most important things in order to try to share my own understanding and the knowledge about the subject. So what I usually do, I start on Monday with uh, posting some kind of trigger. What I usually did uh, in the past was uh, to post either a question or an article. Now, what I discovered uh, is that uh, although this could be an option, uh, it wasn't so satisfactory for me because I couldn't really share what I wanted to share. For me, teaching is about sharing. The whole point of being a teacher is that I have something to share with the students. I have something that I want to share with them. Either because it's interesting, it's something that has excited me, or because I think that it's useful for their own practice. So I realized that recording a video and then post it as a trigger for a forum conversation is the best uh, uh, system for me to adopt. So what I usually do is on Monday of the first week in the block, I post to the forum a video. The video is usually lasting 
in between 30 and 45 minutes but I also had longer videos in case I have longer videos of course I chop them into small segments and the video is supposed to trigger what I usually call pre-webinar forum conversation I use Moodle so you might be familiar with what I mean by forum conversation well the reason I do this is because I want first of all the students to give me feedback as to the lecture so I encourage them to pose questions but I also want the students to give me their own perspective and the main tool that I use as I said before is the Moodle forum now usually I give them roughly a week to watch the video and post at least one question one of the tricks that I use in, in order to engage them is to tell them that 20% of the grade would be a self-assessment of their own participation in those forum conversations what the forum conversation does usually is to create a, a big amount of a big number of comments uh, questions observations on the topic of the video lecture and unfortunately the, vid the forum format doesn't allow me to clarify all the little uh, threats that the video might actually generate and that's the reason why I call this uh, conversation pre-webinar forum conversation because what it leads to is a webinar which usually takes place as I said after a week which means that if I post the video on Monday the webinar usually happens uh, either on on Tuesday or Wednesday it very much depends on students availability what happens during this webinar is that first of all I don't have to lecture this is not an online lecture I actually did this when I started but I saw that it's a killer for the students it's way too much so the webinar is actually based on a conversation what I usually do is to go back to all the questions that questions or comments the students had and then we try together to reorganize our thoughts and in, in a more technical jargon it allows us to create some kind of coherence I actually record the webinars what recording the webinar allows me to do is another important thing which is the last component the last element of this two-week block what sometimes happens in a webinar is that uh, either a student or myself uh, puts forward uh, an argument that is particularly useful to summarize uh, the whole issue that we discussed during the block and what I usually do is to cut out this segment and to repost it for a second conversation a second forum conversation that I usually call post webinar forum conversation post just because it comes after the webinar and this is a, a second chance the students have to go back to uh, the issue the main issue discussed during the block and add uh, further comments now truth be told the post webinar conversations have not been so popular among students probably because the webinar does already a good job in clarifying their doubts so as I said I have uh, four blocks every block is organized as follows first of all we start on Monday with me posting a video lecture what the video is supposed to accomplish is to trigger what I call the pre-webinar forum conversation after that we have the webinar the webinar as I said is a very important is a very important moment because it allows to organize our thoughts collectively and dialogically and then in the end I have the post-webinar forum conversation which is also the way in which very often I try to summarize what have been said during the whole block so this is it indeed what I've just described is uh, uh, the trigger that I actually send back to you and uh, it may become uh, a piece of a conversation that you can have uh, with me with your colleagues or also with yourself thank you very much again for your attention and I hope to see you in the future